Okay, so um, last time we, we started to see, uh, well, we finished actually to derive the, the formula for the entropy of, a, of an idea of gas in the, in the microeconomical ensemble. So uh, just remind you that uh, uh, in the microeconomical ensemble, what we do is to fix the total energy, the total number of particles, the volume, and then basically we use uh, 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 these constraints uh, to see which uh, uh, portion of the phase space is occupied by, by my system. Okay? And uh, uh, we can uh, uh, basically uh, introduce uh, it's called microcanonical ensemble, which basically tells you that uh, the probability to find uh, your system in one of the configurations compatible to the macroscopic constraints uh, is constant. Okay, so basically just a normalization factor. So what we need to do is actually to compute just a portion uh, uh, of a phase space, a volume of a phase space, which is compatible with the macroscopic constraints. Which, in the case of uh, an ideal gas, is basically provided by the, the volume of a, of a spherical shell in which the radius is proportional to the square root of the total energy. <clears throat> and of course, such a calculation can be performed for uh, every kind of system, uh, also in the presence of interaction. Of course, when you have interactions, the integral in, in the generalized coordinates that we have done easily in this case, because it was just v to the power of n, in general, would be very complicated. And actually, we will see this sort of integrals, uh, at least uh, in some approximation, where we will do the, the canonical ensemble. So, in a sense, to introduce the possibility of having uh, interactions uh, among particles. And uh, so, basically, we derive the formula, which is the uh, sacro tetra formula. Uh, and this formula is basically just kb, the logarithm of this portion of the phase space, uh, omega. And uh, it was the following. So it's 3r and kb plus and kb, the logarithm of uh, v divided by m lambda cubed, where lambda is the, uh, way, the thermal wavelength and uh, is given by h uh, divided by square root of 2 and pi kbt. Now, of course, this h was introduced uh, at this level just as a, uh, let's say, normalization constant, so a constant in order to add the right dimension in, in, my, in my entropy or in my volume. It must be uh, an action, so a product of uh, generalized coordinate times, uh, also coordinates times, um, times momentum. And of course, now since we know quantum mechanics, uh, it's clear that this H will be basically the Planck constant. And the fact that this is the Planck constant, uh, of course, has been uh, uh, somehow proved by, by uh, testing uh, this formula for the entropy in a regime where this formula can be applied. Because I actually consider that we did not consider uh, quantum particles in quantum mechanics, but we are considering classical particles. In the sense, we are speaking about ordinate coordinates and momentum of the particle. So, here we are in classical mechanics, although uh, we need at some point to introduce some uh, uh, ingredients of quantum mechanics. And uh, these are now very, uh, very interesting because uh, even if we are at a classical level, we are anyway forced to introduce uh, some information from quantum mechanics. Okay, one of them is just a normalization constant, so maybe this is not very, uh, you know, very exciting. But the most exciting part, uh, most probably, is, uh, is the fact that we need to introduce uh, this uh, correct Boltzmann counting, in which uh, uh, our phase space volume must be corrected by a factor of uh, one over n factorial. <clears throat> and this was necessary 
in order to have uh, an entropy which is uh, extensive and we need the entropy to be an extensive variable and also it's necessary because of something that we will see in a moment which is, which is the Gibbs paradox. Okay, but before uh, coming to, to the Gibbs paradox, uh, so let me just comment this formula a little bit more uh, because last time we didn't finish to do this. So basically, here you see the, in, the, in the argument of the logarithm, apart from this constant here, I have uh, uh, basically uh, somehow to compare the specific volume of a particle, class, the classical, if you want, specific volume, which we can uh, apply. <laughs> This uh, V, which is uh, the total volume divided by M, this is called specific volume. Or, uh, which is also the inverse of the density. Density of particles. And somehow we have to compare the specific volume with the volume which is provided by the cube, by the, the, the thermal wavelength uh, to the power of three. So it's, it's the ratio, if you want, of two specific volumes, some, in some respect. One specific volume, which is the, basically the volume available for a single part, for a particle, classically, and the other one, which is somehow a measure or of uh, how large is the let's say uh, the way the way well, it's the wavelength of the particle okay so clearly this approximation so this formula which has been derived as i said before in classical mechanics must be uh, correct when uh, <coughs> the product of uh, density of particles times uh, 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 thermal wavelength to the power of, of three, this must be much smaller than one. And this is ob obtained, so why I'm saying that? Uh, because, uh, uh, the, so let's say that the volume which is occup occupied by the particle, just consider the wavelength, is much smaller than the classical volume per particle, the specific volume per particle, no? because this would be well, this is one over b, much less than one. So in this limit, we can basically uh, forget about quantum mechanics, the, the, the nature of so the wavelength and so the quantum mechanical nature of our particle. And this would be, of course, now the, the classical limit in which the wavelength is much smaller than the length scale associated with the macroscopic system, which is uh, the, uh, uh, it's the square, uh, the, the, cubits, uh, the cubic root of, uh, of the volume, basically. Okay, so this, this is the condition. Now, how to realize this condition? Uh, there are two things that can be uh, considered. One is that M is very small. So I have a, a small uh, density of particles, which is also usually uh, an assumption that one is doing uh, when, when considering the ideal gas to have a, a small number of particles. Because in this case, uh, we, can, uh, we can avoid, for instance, interaction. But it's not only that is that we can neglect the effect of, uh, let's say, a superposition of, of uh, quantum superposition of the, of, the wave, of the wave functions of the particles, okay? And the other uh, thing is that uh, lambda must be small, so in order for lambda to be small, the t must be large, okay? So we recover, uh, well, we obtain, uh, um, a standard uh, thing that one can expect that uh, statistical mechanics, so classical statistical mechanics, which is in this case provided by this formula for the entropy of ideal gas, is correct when T uh, is large, the temperature is large. So when the temperature 
This model, we, we do expect to have some correction due to quantum mechanics, and of course, we will see this uh, in, the, in, the in the future. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, this formula has been tested, of course, in a regime where classical mechanics is valid, so at large temperature. And one way to test this equation is uh, to, uh, to study, for instance, uh, the latent heat of, uh, of, uh, of a phase associated to a phase transition. So you, you take a sample at very small, small temperature, well, close to zero, basically, and then uh, you see, you, 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 you heat up your system and compute the entropy uh, uh, by, by computing, by, by measuring the latent heat associated with the phase transition. So, in any case, this formula has been tested, and then, of course, one finds that the H, which is uh, in this formula, corresponds uh, exactly to the H of, uh, of the Boltzmann, uh, oh, sorry, of the Planck constant. So, now let me stress another point. Uh, of uh, this formula that uh, is interesting. Uh, so suppose that we start uh, without uh, the correction of the Boltzmann counting. Uh -huh. And uh, also, we, we without uh, H bar, okay, this, this is not uh, H, sorry, the Planck constant is not very really important for the argument, but uh, suppose that we use uh, for the entropy the formula that we derived uh, before adding this n factorial, this uh, additional n factorial. And the, uh, the formula for the entropy was the following uh, is n kb, the logarithm, here I have just volume. Uh, here I can uh, express the temperature as a ratio of the power of three half of, uh, so the inverse of the temperature as a ratio between uh, uh, energy and number of particles. We go also this form. So I have u to the power of three half. Then I have a four third and pi to the power of three half. So, chiudiamo, where U is the energy density, so it's energy divided by, uh, sorry, it's the energy of particle, it's energy divided by number of particles, okay? Let me check if I have everything there. So, volume, yeah, this guy here, yeah. So, this was the, without the, Bolt, the Boltzmann counting, okay? Then we have, we have substituted the, the, the instead of uh, by using the fact that E is equal to three half uh, NKBT, we have uh, derived the, 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 the version that I, that I wrote before, okay, in which uh, there appear the, the thermal wavelength. But uh, we, we actually derived this, this formula. Where here I have not considered the Boltzmann County correction, so I have a volume there. So we already stressed that this formula is a problem in the sense that the volume that appears here makes entropy a non-extensive variable because if I sum two systems with two volumes, I do not get that the, the total entropy is the sum of the two total of the two uh, single entropies. Okay, but there is another problem that actually one can see from this uh, formula, which is the Gibbs, the Gibbs paradox, which is basically uh, the following. So suppose that uh, I have uh, uh, a box uh, in which I have uh, um, a separation that divides the box into two parts. And I have n1 particle here in the volume B1 and n2 particle here in the volume B2, where 1 and 2 are two different types of gas. So 
So, for instance, they could be two different uh, atomic species, or they can have uh, some other counting numbers, okay? Or the easiest thing is that they have a different mass, for instance. Um, and let us assume also Let us assume that the two, these two gas have the same temperature, so T and T, so same temperature. And let us consider the two gas to have also the same density. So N1 divided by V1 is equal to N2 divided by uh, uh, V2. Now, if they have the same temperature, uh, they also have the, the same uh, um, the same energy than the, the same energy per particle, because the energy in general is uh, free out if they are of atomic gas, Kb uh, T times M, therefore, E divided by M is just a function of the temperature. And that implies that if the two gases have the same temperature, they have the same U. So U1 is equal to E1 divided by N1 is equal to U2, which is E2 divided by N2. Okay. So we have two gases. A different number of particles, different volume, same temperature. Uh, the same temperature implies uh, having the same uh, energy per, per particle and the same density. Okay, this equation. Um, yeah, so what would we do now is suppose that we, so these are two different gases, suppose that we remove uh, this barrier. And we ask ourselves, which is the variation of entropy? How does the entropy change? As due to this, uh, uh, the fact that we have removed this, uh, this barrier. Now, of course, what we do expect uh, is to have uh, an increase of the entropy because it is not a reversible uh, process, no? So there will be mixing of these two types of particles that will uh, uh, basically increase uh, the, the entropy. And indeed, this is what we find in the sense that, uh, let's say that before, the entropy was uh, of this, the total system was S1 plus S2, where S1 is equal to, by using the sacrotate of the formula that we we are using it that we derived. Uh, I have a three half and one KB plus and one KB. Then I have the logarithm of uh, okay. So here I have well actually I have some constants that I can also remove. So let me write for a moment. Uh, uh, Okay, no, okay, let, let us do the following way. Okay, so this is V1, this is U to the power of 3 half, which is the same in the two gases. And then I have here a constant, so let me call it K, where uh, K was uh, uh, 4 third and pi to the power of 3 half. So just that I do not have to use always uh, the, the same constant, okay? And let us suppose also that this will not change the argument. Suppose that uh, this k is the same for the, for the two gases, okay? Well, actually, I will, I will uh, show you another example in which the, the, difference, the difference between the two gases is, for instance, the color of the particles. It doesn't make any sense, but just to show. Uh, it can be, a, in general, uh, a certain quantum number that is different in two cases. Okay. Um, so let's call this k, this constant k, just to make it easier. 
And so this is S1, and S2 will be similar to 3 half and 2 kb plus and 2 kb, the logarithm of v1, uh, sorry, v2. Then I have a 2 to the power, u to the power 3 half, and I have a k. Oh yeah, so so that's the, the total entropy uh, before the mixing. So this is before. Now let's see what happens after. Uh, so, so let us compute what happens uh, afterwards. So the only difference uh, when I compute S1 plus S2 uh, is basically this volume here, in the sense that before the uh, particles N1 were allowed to move in a volume which was D1, and the, and the particles 2 were allowed to move in a volume which is V2, Whereas in this case, uh, the total volume available for particle 1 and particle 2 is the total volume, so it's the sum of V1 plus V2. So then, when I compute the total entropy after uh, the mixing, uh, well, these two factors are actually the same. So I have a 3 half and 1 kb, and as two similar as a 3 half and 1 kb plus plus. Uh, so here I, I just have uh, uh, N1 kb, the logarithm of, uh, instead of V1, I uh, put B, U to the power of 3 half is K, and here I have N2 kb, the logarithm of V, U, 3 half K. Okay. So now, if I do the delta S, if I compute the delta S divided by KB, just to make it easier, uh, so that which is the variation of entropy due to mixing. Uh, so this part, this, uh, this cancels, no? and then I have uh, N1, the logarithm of B divided by V1, which comes out from this. And similarly, I have uh, N2 times the logarithm of B divided by B2. <clears throat> and now, of course, this is uh, larger than zero because uh, B uh, is larger than V1 and B uh, is larger, of course, also with respect to B2. So I have an increase of the entropy, uh, which is due to mixing, you know? And this is a mixing entropy, it's called also mixing entropy. Okay, uh, so that's fine, and that, uh, that is actually a result which is uh, which is actually correct. But now the point is that uh, suppose that instead of having uh, so here I'm talking about two different gases, so in the sense that they have a label which I call one and two, which could be whatever you want. Okay, suppose that they are just different gases for. Uh, the sense that the particles are distinguishable, they are not identical particles. And I get this, uh, uh, this result, okay? Um, I don't know, it could be a spin, difference in spin, for instance. A everything that can distinguish between particle one and particle two. But now suppose that uh, I have the same particles in one and two.
And indeed, you see, I could have changed also the mass of the two particles, this is a possible way, and the result will be similar, I just have a difference in K here, okay? But this is not important because this is already the correct results. The main argument is the following. So if I have the same gas instead, and suppose that I have all my gas at a certain temperature and total number of particles and volume here, uh, the total number of volume, uh, sorry, the total volume is D. So a gas which is in thermal equilibrium, okay? So now suppose that uh, for a single gas, I some, somehow put a barrier here that makes the situation similar to the previous one, in which I have on one side of this barrier and one particle in the volume E1, and the, on the other side, and two particles in the volume B2, same temperature, and suppose I take also uh, the barrier in order to have the same density. So the argument that I, I presented before is basically the same. So now if I remove this barrier, I should have a mixing again, okay? So if I remove, I should get again a mixing entropy. And of course, this is a paradox, no? This is a paradox because uh, this system, so this uh, formalism uh, somehow is telling me that uh, uh, somehow my entropy could change uh, even if I put a barrier arbitrarily there, I put this barrier. And then I, I get an increase of the, of the entropy as due to the mixing. Of course, this is not possible if the particles are uh, particles of the same gas. No? So now the magic is again that this uh, situation is corrected, this paradox is removed when we use the correct Boltzmann counting. Okay, so let's do our words. So now the difference with respect to the previous case uh, is that uh, uh, the entropy has, okay, this term which was uh, 3 out KVN, which is not important because this cancels when we go or uh, when we compute the difference uh, in entropy. Uh, what is important is that now the, uh, the other term that we one containing the logarithm as this NKD uh, times the logarithm of V divided by N these times uh, times a constant. Okay, so the Boltzmann counting, the counting actually means that here instead of having a volume, I have a specific volume. So here I have N instead of one. Okay, so this is the only difference. So now, suppose that I compute the delta S for two different gas, as before. So it's the situation, I see, uh, is the same as before, in a sense, N1, V1, same temperature, same energy per particle, uh, same density. So the delta S now will contain uh, a term which is uh, N1, uh, let's put delta S divided by KB so that I can remove this constant which is boring. 
So I will have, after the mixing, I will have N1 times the logarithm of V, which is the total volume available for the particles. And before, now I have, a divide, I have to divide by M1. Okay, times this constant plus M2, the logarithm of V divided by M2 times the constant minus the same quantities before. So it's M1 logarithm of V1 divided by N1 K minus N2 logarithm of V2 divided by N2 times K. Uh, now, this is equal. <clears throat> so, when I put together all the pieces, you see that the, actually the N1 and N2, these two factors, uh, drops. And therefore, I get N1, the logarithm of V divided by V1, so which is this minus uh, this guy, plus N2, N2, the logarithm of. Uh, um, yeah, V divided by V2. As before. Okay. So actually, this formula works when I have two different gases in the sense that the entropy, uh, the, the, the previous formula without the Boltzmann count. And the correct one provide the same increase of the entropy. Okay, the, this correction does not play any role when I have two different uh, uh, types of, uh, of gas. So the, 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 the mixing entropy or the uh, let's say the, uh, the increase of the entropy uh, is the same. But, so now what happens when I do uh, the situation when I do the same calculation with the same gas in the two cases? For the same gas, the entropy uh, after the uh, uh, after I have removed this barrier, uh, again I will not consider the terms uh, uh, which will uh, that drops. I just consider the logarithmic terms. So I have a n log of d v divided by n, which is after k, minus the one at the beginning, which was n1 logarithm of v1 divided by n1, minus n2 the logarithm of v2 divided by n2. Okay. Well, you see that here I have just considered the total number of particles and the, the total volume. Okay. Now this is also equal to, uh, and this is the main difference with respect to the previous case. Okay. So this can be written as n1 logarithm of v divided by n plus n2 the logarithm of v divided by n minus n1. The logarithm of V1 divided by N1 minus N2 log of V2 and 2 So now when I put this together, here what I get is N1 logarithm of V divided by N. And this is the difference with respect to the previous case. Here you have N1 divided by uh, V1. And similarly, I have N2, the logarithm of Vn, and here we have uh, N2, uh, so, yeah, N2 and V2, V1, V1, okay. Mm -hmm. So, with respect to the previous case, which is the difference, basically is here, the denominator, because previously here, I have to, since I have two different gases, 
the, the, the amount of entropy associated with gas one was, uh, let's say, N1, the log of V divided by N1, plus N2, log of V divided by N2. On these times, uh, the gas is the same, and here, the total entropy of the gas after the movement of this uh, barrier is just this one, okay? Now, you see that this is zero because uh, uh, V divided by N and N1 divided by V1 are the same. And the same because by hypothesis, we have considered the gas, the density of the two gas uh, to be the same. So, if I do Vn is equal to 1 divided by n, and n1 divided by v1 is just n1, but n is equal to n1 is equal to n2. Okay? And therefore, this is 0. Okay? You can also understand this uh, with the example I did, I did before, in the sense that you take a, a gas, one, a single gas in a single box, you, you put at some point a barrier. So, of course, you, when you put up this barrier, the density will not change. Now, the density of the gas will not change. So, now if you remove this barrier, the density is still the same. Okay? And uh, therefore, uh, this will be zero, is equal to zero. Equal to zero, and the total, uh, and the total uh, and variation of the entropy is equal to zero. Okay, so you see that uh, um, somehow having introduced uh, this uh, Boltzmann counting uh, has a lot to solve the problem of, uh, of having an extensive variable and at the same time uh, solves also what is called the, G the Gibbs paradox. Okay. So now you can do a couple of exercises uh, out of this formula just to just to play a little bit. Uh, one one exercise is the following. So it's a small exercise. Uh, this I think I take from, from a book, but I don't remember which one. Yeah, anyway, it is, uh, suppose that we have n, n particles, which are, let's say, red, blue, and green. But it could be any other quantum numbers which you want, okay? So you have a total of uh, three n particles, but uh, they can be divided into three categories as due to, for instance, a color or something that can distinguish between the different particles, okay? Uh, or you have a total of three n identical particles. Okay. So the question, uh, yeah, the question is, since we have a formula of the absolute uh, uh, entropy, which is provided by the subtext formula, is to compute the entropy in both cases and compare what you get from uh, the first case and the second case. So, uh, I should get, one, one should get the following, that the, the entropy, the total entropy uh, in which I have the, the, the way, the, a, possible, a way to distinguish between the particles, minus the total entropy in the second situation in which all these particles are identical, uh, one should get this, uh, this uh, difference in entropy. That is 3 and KB logarithm of 3. Okay, so you can try to do it by using the sample 
control. Of course, the correct one, okay? And uh, yeah, so, so the reason is that, of course, when you have uh, uh, these three colors, you can uh, uh, somehow, there, there is an additional uh, contribution to the entropy, which is provided by the mixing entropy. Okay. Uh, okay, this is one exercise. And another possibility, another possible exercise, if you want to try to compute it, um, is to um, So let, let me start from the let me start from the uh, formula that we had before. Um, yeah, so this one. So the entropy, uh, the, the correct one was three half NKD plus NKB, the logarithm of uh, V divided by M. Okay, then uh, okay, then there is E. Okay, I will write it in the following way, and you will see why in a moment. Two M pi T K B divided by H squared to the power of three half. Vediamo se c'ho tutto, quindi è V su N e U N pi T G B a covare. Ok, yeah. so this is the correct one. Where you see, apart from this, uh, this constant, so S is a number, which is 3 half N K B plus N K B. And uh, let me just uh, uh, stress which is the scaling with respect to V and T. So here you have a logarithm in which there appear the volume and the temperature to the power of three half actually, times a certain constant that I call alpha. Okay, what, I, what I'm interested in is just the scaling here, uh, which is uh, V here, and uh, uh, t to the power of 3 half, and then I have a constant that contains everything, including also n, which is constant, okay? And all the other variables. Now, of course, this is the absolute uh, entropy, and uh, there is, a, let's say, also the possibility, so there is this additional constant here, and since I have a logarithm, it's not trivial really to have uh, uh, the proper factors inside the logarithm, because, of course, uh, when you have a constant uh, in, a, in a logarithm, it's just an additional constant, okay? Now, one can do uh, the calculation in the, of the entropy, one can compute, let's say, the entropy, well, actually, the variation of the entropy, compute the variation. Of the entropy, also in let's say pure thermodynamics, so without so without uh, uh, using the microcanonical ensemble, that is what we have done, which of course is, is more powerful as a method because it will. Uh, Gives us uh, will give us the uh, the correct factors inside the logarithm and this additional factor there. Uh, but you can do the calculation of a variation of entropy also uh, in thermodynamics. 
and you might check that the scaling that you have here in the logarithm is actually the same as it should be. Okay, so uh, just uh, uh, to show you, so that, so let's say the problem will be to verify that delta has, has the same scaling. In V and T by just using a thermodynamics. <clears throat> and indeed, in thermodynamics, you cannot determine the absolute uh, entropy, you can just determine the variation of entropies. And typically, to compute the variation of entropy, uh, you need to uh, uh, to do transformations, right? So, first of all, let us remember which is the, the first principle of thermodynamics um, plus the U or V or V E here is the same. Okay, in thermodynamics, I write internal energy, micro canonical ensemble, I write total energy, but actually are the same. And in any case, this can be written as PDV plus CV dt. That holds true for an ideal gas, where CV is the uh, heat capacity at constant volume. So now you see that from here you can compute a variation of entropy which will be uh, given by these two terms, you know, PdV plus Cv dt. So suppose that you, you want to compute uh, the variation of entropy from going uh, so one has from going to a, from a state A to a state B, and you want to compute the delta S. Uh, sorry. S B minus S A. So basically, to use uh, uh, this formula, you need to imagine a path, a possible path that makes you going from A to B. And of course, the, the, the choice of the path is, uh, say, it's, uh, you can do whatever choice you like in the sense that uh, the entropy is a state variable. And therefore, the difference in, in entropies does not depend on a specific path that you use for, for going uh, to go from A to B. Sorry, today I'm completely uh, tired. Um, so now, uh, yeah, the possibility is the following, that you draw a line, which is an isothermal, and then a line, which is a, a a line of constant volume. I think I have done it this way, but you can try to imagine other possibility. So suppose that V is, uh, is here, and uh, one possibility is the following that you draw an isotherm out here, then you move. Uh, Onto this isotherm up to down to a point, let's call it A star, which has the same volume of B. And then you go from A star to B by following an, uh, an isopora. Iso well, honestly, I'm not sure if in English is called uh, isochronic. Sorry, let me check. I know that this is registered, but I want to I want to check. Come si dice isopora in inglese? Qualcuno lo sa? No, purtroppo no. <laughs> isocoric, forse. I think it's isocoric. Yes, it's isocoric. But, uh, okay. Isocoric. Next year, I will know. Honestly, it didn't happen to me to to say isopolic in any context. <laughs> okay, in any case. 
Um, so you, you can do the calculation by following, for instance, this isochronic, uh, in which you go from A star to B with the same by following uh, a line of constant B. Uh, so why I'm doing this choice? In the first case, from A to A star, this is an isothermal, and since this is an isothermal, we just have the contribution from this term. Okay, so here, just you just need to consider PDB. So you, when you compute the variation, let's say S uh, of uh, A star minus S of A, this will be an integral from A to A star on a hydrothermal of PDB. Because the other term will vanish since you are moving uh, by following an uh, isothermal. Then you can compute uh, uh, the isochoric variation, so the variation of the entropy uh, along this isochoric, and so you, you do Sb minus S of A star, which is the integral from A star to B, uh, now, this isochoric for this PDB will vanish, and therefore you just need to consider CB, uh, CB dt. I think I'm uh, uh, skipping, yeah, so you have a temperature, sorry, and also here you have a temperature. No, because, uh, yeah, so this TDS, and so I will have these two temperatures there. Let me check. If it is correct. Yeah. And you might uh, remember also that CV for a monatomic gas is, uh, well, it is you know, because if you know the energy, this is just the derivative with respect to the temperature. And the CV is provided by 3 half and AP. So you can try to compute uh, uh, these two and variation of entropies. Then you will sum them, and of course, uh, uh, this S of A star will be uh, removed, and you will have a variation of SB minus SA. And you, what you uh, should see is that this variation of entropy is, of course, the same that one obtains uh, when using the SACO theta formula. And so, something like, like that. that uh, So if you if you try to do the calculation, you can uh, then tell me if this is correct. But uh, the result should be the following: is I have n k b times the logarithm of b b t b to the power of three half. Well, this must be correct, of course. Yeah. And this B A T A to the power of three half. Okay, so you, you might check if this is correct. Now, of course, one can one thing that one cannot one thing that uh, is not possible to do in thermodynamics uh, is uh, uh, now to have uh, uh, the proper. Uh, the proper additional factors uh, that we have uh, in the law, in which when we compute the, the, the variation of entropies, then thermodynamics is fine because these factors will actually drop. If you want to compute an absolute uh, entropy, then uh, you need to use the microcanonical ensemble. Okay? There. <clears throat> So now, in this course, of course, is uh, really the first year, so it, it, is, it is necessary a little bit experimental. So what I would like to try to do now 
is again within the microcanonical ensemble. Uh, well, actually, this is more general. Than, but first of all, we can obtain uh, uh, for the first time one thing that you cannot do. Well, you don't don't do usually in thermodynamics, uh, namely to have an expression for the chemical potential. That is a quantity that is somehow mysterious, uh, still still mysterious at this level. Is a quantity that somehow uh, I have to introduce uh, when I change uh, the number of particles. Uh, and similarly, when I, when I change the energy, uh, I have to introduce the temperature. And similarly, if you want, when I change the number of particles, uh, I need to introduce the chemical potential. And the chemical potential, uh, for instance, uh, appears in the expression of the Gibbs potential which is the right pot thermodynamical potential that needs to be minimized in a situation in which the total pressure and the total temperature is fixed, okay? So the second principle of thermodynamics at fixed pressure and temperature is a minim minim minimization of the Gibbs potential. Now, uh, and of course, we need to somehow have a little bit more experience of what this chemical potential is. Why is called chemical potential? Well, basically because uh, uh, this quantity is very crucial indeed when dealing with reactions. Of course, not only in chemistry, but in general. You can, whatever uh, types of uh, reaction, it can be a chemical reaction, nuclear reaction, uh, uh, reaction involving uh, uh, subatomic particles. In any case, uh, you will have uh, these quantities, uh, which are the chemical potentials, which are crucial when investigating, uh, for instance, uh, the dynamics of, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of this kind of reactions. Okay? So I, I would like to, you to get more familiar with this quantity. And therefore, what I will do is to uh, compute uh, so to study a little bit more this chemical potential, and uh, as application of the formula that we will derive uh, for the chemical potential, we will actually consider one thing, which is the um, uh, this, this <coughs> it's called the mass action law. And with a specific application in the case of the uh, uh, ionization of the problem of ionization thermal ionization. Ecco, voi per esempio la, la, law, la mass action law l'avete vista da qualche parte? Scusi, sto finendo di scrivere. Io a memoria no. No, ok. Com ok, ok. Ok, nessuno l'ha vista, va bene. Uh, well, actually, this mass action law has, uh, let's say, two ways to be uh, written, one way which is uh, uh, more typical for, uh, for chemists, which is the one that I will do because it allows to, to infer something which is, uh, which is interesting, uh, I think. And the, and the other way to write it is uh, more used uh, in, the, let's say in the physical, in the context of physics, which is just an equation of thermodynamic or chemical equilibrium, basically. Okay? Well, the, 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 let's say that the main topic is here is what is chemical equilibrium. Well, we actually, we have seen already, actually, that the chemical equilibrium is realized when we have uh, the, uh, the equality. I think we, we have done this in some, some, some case. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. That the chemical potential, uh, when I have chemical equilibrium, when the chemical potential of these different parts are the same. Okay. 
but we will uh, somehow re-derive uh, these results in a different way and in connection with reactions, okay? So the first thing that I would like to do is to, uh, is to find a formula for the chemical potential uh, in the case of the ideal gas and by using uh, the sacral tetrad formula. Uh, yeah, so he wrote that S is equal to 3 alpha MKB plus MKB, the logarithm of B, P, and lambda Q. Where lambda is the thermal wavelength. Then, uh, okay, here I'm using the ideal gas and monatomic gas. And uh, uh, therefore, okay, for ideal gas, uh, I have the standard equation of state, which is uh, uh, the following. And also, I know that the internal energy or the total energy, the same, is three half and a b p. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let us remember which is the the relation between the chemical potential and the other quantities. Um, so we might start from this TBS is equal to PDB plus DU. And then there is a minus, yeah, minus mu dn. So you see that from here. If I want to derive the chemical potential, I need to compute a derivative of entropy with respect to n at fixed internal energy and fixed volume. Okay, so from this, I get a mu is equal to minus T times the derivative of entropy with respect to n, when I fix uh, internal energy and volume, okay? So, now this is the sample state of the formula, and I can compute now the chemical potential by just doing a derivative, okay? One thing that one, one, one has to be careful with one thing. So here I'm changing uh, n, of course, because I'm computing a derivative. Ah, ma c'è una delle domande. Ah, no, no, okay, no. Um, but uh, I have to fix the total energy and the, uh, sorry, the internal energy and the volume. Now, so to do this calculation, it's important to have inside the, the argument of the logarithm the explicit dependence of, uh, uh, of the lambda from u in particular. Okay, otherwise I will do, uh, otherwise I will have uh, uh, the wrong calculation. Okay, so when I do the derivatives of this quantity with respect to n, I must consider that actually implicitly also the lambda is a quantity that depends implicitly on n because if I change the total number of particles by keeping a u constant, actually I need to somehow change also the temperature. Okay, so, so to do this calculation properly, uh, I need to derive from here the temperature. So I have that u. Uh, Two thirds u divided by n is equal to kpt. Okay. So then now I can write this formula 
Okay, so this way you, you have it. Now you have to compute minus the derivative of entropy with respect to particles at fixed internal energy and volume. So now let me write again this equation in the following way. So this is three out n to b plus n to b logarithm of v e. Then I have n, and then I have a lambda cube, and this lambda cube is a no factor messo così. So it's h cube. Hopla. Uh, then I have uh, two m pi to the power of three half. Yeah. Then I have uh, instead of k d t, I, I write two thirds u divided by n to the power of three half. So here I have a uh, two. Third, the power of three half again, and the u divided by n, the power of three half. <clears throat> so, so some Uh, I think I'm doing something wrong. Sì, perché questo sta al numeratore, vero? Ok, sorry. So here I have a lambda cube, which is h cube, of course, and then I have uh, this, as a, this as, a, as a minus, right? The minus 3 half. Yeah. Minus, this is minus, and this is also minus. Ok. Quindi ho V è diviso N, poi ho l'H cubo, sì, e poi ho questo qui, che sta denominato a minus 3 half, minus 3 half, minus 3 half, ok. Ok, Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is also equal to T hal N K B plus N K B the logarithm of let me write it again. So this is V divided by N and I have A H to the power of uh, three. Then I have a four third m pi, four third m pi to the power of three half, power of three half. Yeah, so then I have a u divided by n to the power of three half. Yeah, so now I can compute the derivative of S with respect to N at fixed volume and fixed internal energy because here you have an explicit dependence now on V, N, and U. I do not have the temperature in this case. And uh, this is the way I have to do this calculation, otherwise, I get some wrong result. Uh, wrong result. <clears throat> And so now I can compute this derivative. I will get the first factor, which is 3 half and 3 half kb. 3 half kb plus, uh, now I have uh, kb, kb, the logarithm. Of, uh, let me write this in, a, in, a, in a, as in the previous as in the previous form, which was v e n lambda cube, because I just I, I not need to keep now the dependence on u anymore uh, because I have the right with respect to n. 
then I have this additional factor, of course, which is the derivative of the logarithm. Okay, so then I have n k b, n k b, uh, the derivative with respect to n of the logarithm of, okay, so here there are many, many factors. So let's try to simplify our life. So uh, basically, I have to derive with respect to uh, with respect to n, and you see from here that n has a power of uh, three half plus one, which is uh, uh, n to the power of, of minus five divided by two. So this n to the powers uh, minus five divided by two. Uh, see, and then of course there is a constant k that you drop, where k is equal to volume and e h q. Four third and five three half and I have a u to the power of three half again. And of course, this constant. This constant because I have fixing the u again okay, and also fixing d. So. So now, uh, yeah, so this is uh, uh, 3 of kb plus kb logarithm of d, e, n, lambda, q. Um, then I have uh, class n, kb. Now I have to compute the derivative of this logarithm, and I have uh, n to the power of uh, 5 uh, half. Uh, divided by k times k, and I have a minus uh, 5 half and n to the power of minus 7 divided by 2. Let me see if this is correct. Quindi c'è l'etica per qui a fuori, poi le dico quello, un k di denominatore, poi il denominatore, poi c'è k, poi c'è meno 5 mezzi, Cinque mezzi meno uno, ok. So, tops, then I have uh, one plus five divided by two minus seven is one. Then I just this is just minus uh, five divided by two uh, kb. Ok. This three out KB plus KB log of B and lambda Q. And so again, the expression is actually very simple. Uh, this is three out KB minus five out KB, which is a uh, minus KB. So then uh, we have a KB logarithm of V e divided by n lambda cube minus kb but let me write kb as kb times the logarithm of e so then I can collect the kb here and simplify this e and so then at the end So in the end, my uh, chemical potential, this was a minus uh, T times this derivative. Okay, so now this is equal to KB logarithm of V divided by M lambda Q. Now you have to multiply by T, uh, so by minus T. So therefore, the chemical potential is KBT, the logarithm 
of uh, n lambda cube divided by the log n. Okay. So now this formula provides uh, the correct uh, uh, expression for the chemical potential uh, for uh, ideal gas, mo monatomic ideal gas. And actually, you will find uh, uh, in the next lectures where, when we will deal with uh, canonical ensemble, well, actually, grand canonical ensemble, there are other ways to compute this relation that we will see uh, in the future. We can check that this relation is correct. So, here, this has been derived by the Sapper table formula. Okay. So, once I have uh, uh, N, V, and temperature, I can fix what the chemical potential is. Okay, so now one thing that uh, is a uh, is typical uh, thing in uh, uh, thermostatistics or uh, in chemistry is to divide the chemical potential into two pieces, one containing the pressure and the other one containing just the, uh, the temperature. Okay, so typically one does the following thing. So, so we know that PV is equal to 9 kVT. So then instead of uh, uh, N divided by V, I can substitute P divided by kVT. Okay, so I can split the chemical potential into two parts. One of them is uh, uh, kVT, the logarithm of the pressure. Okay, plus uh, kBT again, kBT, and then I have the logarithm of lambda uh, cube divided by kBT. So in which in which case, uh, apart from this kBT. I have a term uh, that is proportional to the pressure, to the logarithm of the pressure, and another term which depends just on the temperature. Okay, uh, and actually the second term we call it T. Is by definition this KBT logarithm of lambda cube divided by kbt and this is it has a name which is called chemical constant well to some respect, uh, why, why is uh, uh, useful to, to make this uh, uh, somehow splitting? Although here you might be worried about the fact that I have a quantity which, is, which has dimension in the logarithm and also here. But in any case, you know the expression that we will find, these two terms are always added together, so then it comes out that the dimension then are correct, of course. Okay? But the, the, the reason for doing that uh, is that uh, here I have a quantity which depends on the temperature and pressure. And typically, in the situation I will uh, deal with, uh, I somehow fix the temperature and the pressure. Uh, so I work with the fixed temperature and the fixed, temp and the fixed French pressure. Uh, which is the situation in which I have to minimize the Gibbs potential. And so this is, a, let's say, a global quantity, if you want. Whereas this quantity here contains, uh, in the lambda, some specific property of the gas, which is, for instance, the mass of the particle I'm, I'm dealing with. And those, in principle, there is another thing here that is not, uh, I have not here because I'm just considering monatomic gas, which is a degeneracy factor that I will uh, introduce later on. Okay? So, somehow, these uh, 
term contains uh, the, let's say the global behavior of my system in, in terms of temperature and pressure, whereas this part here contains, uh, let's say, the chemical part, in the sense that here, uh, this part here is different for the different gas that I have in my, in my system with many components. Because at the end, what I want to do is to study, uh, by using the chemical potential, is to study uh, physical systems in which I have several chemical components and I want to see uh, how and, uh, and in which situation I can get equilibrium of the several components, okay? So that, therefore, this one here will characterize uh, uh, the different components of my mixture. Um, so now, uh, by using the, indeed this formula, we can now start to uh, write uh, uh, the equation for the chemical reactions. <clears throat> so, so first of all, I have a mixture of different atoms or molecules or particles, whatever you want. And within this mixture of different uh, particles, I can have reactions. By reaction, if you want, I mean, uh, in a, let's say, in a language which is more uh, uh, more similar, uh, maybe to, to physics, uh, is uh, let's say process of uh, uh, inelastic scattering, if you want. Okay. So, so typically to write uh, uh, these uh, reactions, one introduce the following formula. Uh, a reaction is written in this, uh, in this way. So this is the general form of a reaction where this AI is, if you want, the name of the particle. Uh, it could be neutron, a proton, it could be hydrogen, oxygen, etc. Uh, the, the, the species of particles that I'm considering. And this new I, it's a, a, the <coughs> stoichiometric coefficient. Which somehow is telling me how many particles of the type of AI I need for a reaction to, to occur. Okay. So for instance, just to make you just to make some example. Suppose that I have this reaction here. Uh, so one, one possibility is this uh, dissociation of this molecule. Okay. Um, in which, uh, of course, now, so this is written in this form uh, as, uh, uh, as written here, which means basically that I can have a reaction on which I have a dissociation of this molecule, which is uh, 3H2 plus N2, uh, which is a dissociation process, or I can also the inverse. Okay, this is just arbitrary. The, 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 the direction of the reaction is arbitrary. You will see in a moment why. Okay, I have a formation of this particle, of this molecule. 
But uh, let's say I can put this uh, minus overall minus factor and I will get the opposite, okay? So it's not important. But suppose that I write it in the following way. And then what I read here are the stoichiometric coefficients, so which are 2, minus 3, and minus 1, respectively. Okay. So uh, let's say that let's call this part this molecule uh, A1, this molecule H2, we call it A2, and this A3, and therefore mu1 is equal to 2, mu2 is equal to minus 3. And mu three is equal to minus one. Okay. Of course, I could do also the opposite. In a sense, I could write this with a overall minus one, minus one, but this is not important. And it would be minus two plus three plus one. Okay. Um, these are completely. Uh, I'm free to choose whatever I want. Okay. So they are determined determine, uh, but for a factor of minus one. And okay, this can chemistry, uh, but similarly, I can have a reaction that you are more familiar with, which is, for instance, uh, uh, um, a weak reaction like this one, in which I have an uh, uh, electron captured by a proton with the formation of a neutron and a uh, Electron neutrino. Now, here this is just chemistry, and so this is electromagnetism, whereas here is weak interaction, okay? But the formalism is, basic, is basically the same, okay? So now, in this kind of reaction, uh, again, let me call A1 the electron, A2 the proton, A3 the neutron, and A4 the neutrino. Uh, the then the stoichiometric coefficients will be u1 is equal to 1, u2 is equal to 1, u3 is equal to minus 1, and u4 is equal to minus 1. Okay? So every kind of reaction somehow can be written in this form. Okay? Uh, so something like that. An equation in which you have the, uh, the stoichiometric coefficients. Uh, times uh, the, the name of, of, my, of my particles or of my uh, molecule. Okay, so now of course um, in physics usually we have this kind of reaction. Usually, in the sense that the small these uh, stoichiometric coefficients are in print, so most of the cases are just one, one minus one minus. But uh, there are situations, uh, especially in the context uh, of in which I have plasma, in which actually the stoichiometric coefficients will be different with respect to one and minus one. Okay. Uh, but for instance, when I consider the re nuclear reactions in the sun, in which uh, uh, the all the fusion processes that are occurring actually involves several uh, uh, several particles. Okay. So the stoichiometric coefficient will be different from, from one or, or minus one. Io vedo che già sono l'una meno meno un quarto. So do you mind if we uh, continue uh, till uh, half past one? So we, if we do, eh, se facciamo una mezz'oretta in più, come io ho detto l'altra volta, per cercare di recuperare un po'. Io personalmente sono un po' stretto perché ho lezione poi alle due. Okay. Però posso, vabbè, posso guardare la, la lezione sì. se la sta registrando. Forse sì. non si è detto nulla, quello a cui avevamo pensato, meno, adesso non so chi fosse stato informato sul nostro gruppo di fisica, ma mi sembrava si fosse detto che venerdì poteva essere un giorno più adatto magari per fare una lezione in più. No, no. Ah, ma io ho lezione ogni giorno, non riesco venerdì perché ho l'altro corso. Ah, ok. Ok. Vabbè, allora se non potete, se non potete allora il martedì fare una mezz'oretta, il martedì fare una mezz'oretta in più, vedremo come recuperare poi alla fine. Cioè, diciamo che la mia proposta era soltanto per cercare di anticipare una mezz'oretta a settimana, che così magari finiamo un po' prima. Se, se non riusciamo, vedremo come recuperare verso la fine. Però io ho lezioni tutti i giorni, quindi non riesco a fare, 
non riesco a farvi lezione altri giorni, cioè sono, sono pieno. E l'unica cosa che riesco a fare è prolungare una lezione di una mezz'oretta, un'ora massimo. Quindi, non lo so, quindi che faccio? Mi fermo a luna oggi? Per quanto mi riguarda, può anche andare avanti e io recupero la lezione. Non so se gli altri... Allora, facciamo così. Cosa vogliono fare? Senti. Facciamo così, allora, facciamo così che per oggi magari continuo fino all'una e mezza. Dopodiché vi mettete d'accordo tra di voi e mi fate sapere. Cioè, se volete in qualche modo che, che prolunghiamo così, va bene. Altrimenti troveremo il modo di recuperare le lezioni verso la fine. Diciamo che una volta che io finisco l'altro corso, però avendo cominciato due settimane dopo, anche l'altro corso finirà probabilmente nella seconda settimana di giugno. Quindi ci, ci potremmo ritrovare in quel periodo un po' pieni di lezioni. Quindi, vabbè, lo no, facciamo così. Per oggi, se non vi dispiace, farei questa mezz'oretta in più. Dopodiché vi mettete d'accordo e decidiamo come procedere, va bene? Va bene. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, so this formalism here uh, is, is general. Okay, it can be uh, used for chemical reaction like this one, or it can be used for uh, uh, subatomic reactions uh, such as one, such as uh, this weak interaction uh, process. Okay. So now, let us uh, consider a situation in which I have a fixed pressure and fixed temperature. I, know, I do not need to specify the temperature, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, somehow, well, in principle, also the pressure. Okay, we will come in a moment. Okay, but let's work with fixed pressure and fixed temperature. And, uh, um, yeah, so, and we have, of course, now a mixture of particles. that can react reactions now from the second principle of thermodynamics uh, i know that uh, in the, term, in, the, in the thermodynamical equilibrium, which is in this case basically provided by the chemical equilibrium, but let's be more general. So in thermodynamical equilibrium, uh, in, in a situation in which, in which I fix the pressure and I fix the temperature, What is uh, obtained is a minimization, or you have to minimize, what is called the Gibbs potential. Okay. Now, what is the Gibbs potential? In the case of a single, I uh, saw so before the variation of the Gibbs potential. So in the case of a single species, the Gibbs potential and the, so the variation of the, G, the Gibbs potential was mu times dn, so times the variation of the number of particles. If I have uh, several types of particles, the, G, the Gibbs potential, the total Gibbs potential will just be the sum of this. And so, so therefore, this minimization of the Gibbs The Gibbs potential, sorry, today uh, the tongue is not working at all. And uh, uh, so to write this equation, basically I have to write the, the sum over j of mu j times d and j is equal to zero. 
where j runs over all the particle species. Okay. So remember that the g exponential was new. So I generalize this uh, <coughs> and uh, um, this is the, vari the variation, sorry, of the Gibbs potential was uh, So I generalize this uh, uh, to the case of several components. And the equation that I need to impose is the following. Of course, now what happens is that the number nj could change in the sense that since I have chemical reactions, I can change the number of each species of particle. It's not that I'm uh, allowed putting new particles or extracting particles from the system. I just have a system which is uh, maybe isolated from the, uh, from outside for what concerns the number of particles. Of course, it's kept, it's kept to a uh, fixed pressure and temperature. But inside my, let's say my box, so some chemical reactions are occurring. And therefore, the total number, so the number of particles with a, of species J could change as due to the reactions. Okay. Now, so this, this is the equation that provides the situation of uh, thermodynamical equilibrium or chemical equilibrium, if you want, in this case. And now, suppose that uh, the task uh, called N the number of reaction for instance per unit time but this is not important at all that is occurring in my system of course if i have uh, n reaction or n reaction per unit time the variation of dnj the variation of nj of the number of particle j could be proportional to n times the stoichiometric coefficient. Because for each reaction, I know that the um, I know that the particle j has let's say a multiplicity of a new j in the sense in order for such a reaction to occur, I need new j new uh, j uh, particles of type j okay so therefore the variation of this nj will be proportional to the stoichiometric coefficient times this rate of reaction that is the uh, uh, let's say number n okay so now um, yeah so now basically actually this e and j are proportional to n times mu j, and therefore, again, this is n is the same quantity for all of the parts, it just counts of, it just counts the number of reactions per unit time, and the total number of reactions is not important, because any, anyway it's factorized. So, the minimization of the Gibbs potential now reads uh, as a sum of a j of mu j, times mu j is equal to zero. Okay, so this is the, uh, basically the, um, the general way to write a chemical equilibrium. Okay. So the chemical equilibrium is provided by this equation. The chemical, uh, the chemical potential of, of each species times the stoichiometric coefficients, I sum all of them and I must, I must get zero. Okay? So for instance, in the case of uh, uh, a process I'm more familiar with like this one, uh, what I need to uh, impose in order to uh, establish a chemical equilibrium is that the chemical potential of the electrons plus the chemical potential of the proton 
must be equal to the chemical potential of the neutron plus the chemical potential of the uh, neutrino. Okay, so these kind of equations are very, uh, very often used in the context of, uh, say, physics uh, in the context of astrophysics, for instance, or nuclear astrophysics. <clears throat> of course, in here the stoichiometric coefficients are one, one minus one minus one minus one. So therefore, I write I can write this equation in terms as mu e plus mu e is equal to mu n plus mu n. But now, since we have a uh, specific, we have found an expression for mu j, we can write this chemical equilibrium condition in a in a way that uh, uh, somehow involve the temperature, the pressure, and these uh, uh, chemical constants that we were uh, talking about before. So now this is equal to the sum of uh, <coughs> so zero is equal to the sum of j mu j mu j, which is equal to the sum of j, what was kt the logarithm? Now I use the formula for the um, for the chemical potential for each species. So here we have a pj, which is the pressure of uh, the component j of my mixture of gas. This is times mu j. And then I have the chemical constant, which I separate, so plus j of mu j, and then I have this uh, k j. <coughs> Where, as I said before, pj is called partial pressure. of the J component. <clears throat> now, what is the partial pressure? It's not that uh, I'm saying that uh, the pressure is uh, somehow uh, an, extent, an extensive variable, so I'm not really summing up all the, uh, summing up uh, the pressure of uh, one plus the pressure of two. It's just basically a way uh, to, um, so it's just basically a definition of uh, um, like, like a useful definition in the sense that the partial pressure is defined to be as the fraction of the pressure, as a pre total pressure times the concentration of the particle J. So basically, uh, if I introduce this C J, which is the concentration, so which is by definition N J, so number of particle J divided by N, where N is the total number of particles. The C J is called concentration. And by definition, PJ is a, a CJP. So is the is the component? If you want, that is the uh, is the component uh, uh, of the total pressure which is associated with uh, with, uh, with the component. J, okay, it's the part of the pressure which is associated with the component J. Of course, the pressure will be a quantity uh, which is intensive, but, okay, but I, have, I can have several contribution to the total pressure, okay, but it's not, the situation is not that if I have two systems, I have to sum the, the two pressures, okay. These are the, the components of the total, uh, so they say the contribution of the several species to the total pressure. Which is which will be still an intensive variable. 
Uh, yeah, so, so let us uh, now introduce uh, this uh, definition uh, in, in here. So I have now that zero is equal to the uh, sum of j, k, b, t, logarithm of total pressure times uh, uh, new j. So let me write this in this way, this fashion. So log p, where p is the total pressure. And so this is log p times uh, uh, times uh, kbt times the sum of j. Okay, what would be so? Okay. Okay, no, really. so kbt and then I have the sum of j of mu j. Uh, then I have the class. Uh, sum j kdt the logarithm of uh, cj cj and i have plus the sum j of mu j kj and this must be equal to zero all of this i think i forgot one uh, new j here so this kg t and here i have a new j and so we are to do this for k of t logarithm of quello per quello yeah yeah so i think i have everything so now uh, let me do some more a little bit more algebra. So I can divide by kbt and put this term on the left hand side. So I have 1 minus kbt sum of j of mu uh, j chi j. And then here I have uh, uh, sum of j and the log of cj to the power of mu j and uh, plus plus i have the log of p and p is to the power of the sum of j of mu j so it's the log of p uh, which is uh, as a power of mu j here. Okay. Thank you. We are very to talk. Okay, so. Uh, I'm almost done. One minus kbt uh, sum of j mu j chi j minus log of p to the power of uh, sum of j mu j. And here I have sum of j log of cj to the power of mu j. It's a clear. Good. So now let me put an exponential to both sides, both sides. And uh, uh, so when I do the exponential, I will have an exponential of this quantity. Then I have a p to the minus uh, uh, sum of j, and here you have a product, you know, because we have the exponential of a sum of logarithm, and therefore I, I, I will get an equation uh, 
that tells me that the product of G over J of CJ times uh, the power of mu J. So this is equal to uh, pressure to minus uh, sum of J of mu J. And then I have a quantity which I call A of T, where A of T is just the exponential of 1 minus KBT sum over J of mu J times chi J. Okay. <clears throat> So now the equation that we have there is uh, indeed an equation that uh, uh, can be like a lot, which is uh, called the law of mass action. Okay, and uh, the quantity p to the power of minus, so the second uh, part of this equation basically, times uh, a, a of t. This is called the equilibrium constant or reaction constant. So basically what this equation is telling us is that, uh, so here on the left hand side, I have a, a, a situation in which, uh, so this, once I fix the reaction that can happen in my, in my system, I have fixed the stoichiometric coefficient, suppose that I work with a fixed pressure, and also the temperature is fixed in my situation, I'm fixing the pressure. So basically, what I have on the left and on the right hand side is, a, so is just a function of the total pressure and the temperature. And of course, uh, even in here, there is some information on the chemical species that are uh, uh, inside my mixture. Whereas here, I can have a quantity that is the concentration of the, of the particles uh, okay, to the power of the stoichiometric coefficients. So when I have, uh, when I am sitting on the, uh, on the situation of thermodynamical equilibrium, basically what this equation is telling me is that if I measure the concentration of, of, of all of the particles in my system, and I, I do this, uh, this calculation, then this quantity is basically a constant in the sense that it depends just on pressure and temperature. Okay, so basically, what this equation is telling me that is suppose that I start uh, with a with a mixture of gas in which I have a certain concentration of uh, uh, of particles A and B, and uh, and particles A and B can do some some reaction. Okay. So, in general, my initial concentration will be such that the chemical reaction can occur, but actually, at the end of the process, all this concentration must be, must somehow, um, must have a value which is consistent with this formula. Okay? So, let me make some example just to, just to understand how this equation is telling something interesting. So suppose that uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, process uh, yeah, suppose that I have this chemical process H2 uh, Uh, 
Questo è CL. Ah, questo è CL, sì, ok. Yeah, maybe it's better to indicate this in the following way. So, uh, yeah, I think I wrote this uh, CL2, but actually this is uh, 2CL. <clears throat> okay, so it means that I have two, uh, two uh, a factor of two there. And uh, <clears throat> oh, no, 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 sorry. Okay, so sorry, I'm mixing up. So this the uh, sorry the molecular hydrogen and the molecular chloride. Okay, sorry. Okay, and we are starting with this kind of reaction, which is two H uh, Cl. Okay, so these are your molecular uh, dissociation or molecular formation, depending on which side I'm. Uh, I'm looking at this reaction. So the stoichiometric coefficients, uh, suppose that I want to write uh, uh, the equation like in this way, Cl2 minus uh, uh, 2H Cl equal to zero. So then the stoichiometric coefficients will be one, one, and minus two. So therefore, if I look at this equation, So the, the left hand side is telling me that the concentration of H2 to the power of 1, so it's, it's a 1 there, times the concentration of Cl2 again to the power of 1, then I have times the concentration of uh, the molecular uh, form so this, mo this molecule uh, to the power of minus two, therefore will be a concentration of HCl to the power of two. This is equal to A of T. Why? Because in this case, uh, the sum of, uh, of the stoichiometric coefficients is zero because we have one plus one minus two, which is zero. And therefore, at the equilibrium, this ratio of concentration will just depend on the temperature. Okay, so basically what he's telling me is that suppose that I fix the temperature and I already know that at the equilibrium the concentration of the, these two, uh, these different molecules will be provided by this equation. So it cannot be whatever ratio of concentration, it's not, it, must, it must respect this uh, uh, this uh, mass action law. Okay, so once I fix the temperature, this is a number, and then I know that the equilibrium of the concentration must look, must fulfill this equation. So then that means that suppose that I start with a, an initial concentration. Um, okay, so there are several ways to, to, to interpret also this equation. So suppose that uh, uh, HP is a large number. Okay, so at a fixed temperature for a certain type of reaction, this is large. So when this is large, that means that the reaction will prefer to have small values of this HCl, for instance, and therefore the reaction will try to go in this direction. So if I start with certain initial concentration, actually my reaction will be uh, will uh, let's say we follow the evolution which 
the number of this molecule is decreasing. Okay, if this number is large. So somehow, once I consider, I compute this number, and I can compute this number because it's a, just a function of temperature, I can see immediately in which direction my system will evolve. If this, is not, this number is large, let's say, I, I will have to have a small number of these molecules, HCl. On the, other, on the other hand, if this number is small, let's say, I would prefer actually to produce uh, many of these molecules. Okay, so the reaction will follow the other direction. So basically, this law tells me something which is very interesting. Once I fix the temperature, I can compute A, and I immediately know in which direction the system will move for what concern uh, the chemical reactions. Okay, it will move in another, in one way or, or, the, or the other way depending on my initial uh, uh, concentration, okay? And uh, another example is the following. <laughs> okay, this is uh, less chemical, so I get less confused because with chemistry I'm not so uh, familiar, of course. <laughs> but uh, I suppose that we have instead uh, this situation in which we have uh, uh, hydrogen, and we have the possibility of forming molecular hydrogen. So in this case, the stoichiometric coefficients are one, one, and one, and sorry, and minus one. Okay. So now in this case, uh, if I write again the mass action law for this situation, I have the, the concentration of atomic hydrogen times the concentration of the atomic hydrogen, which is a concentration squared. Then I have to multiply by the concentration of the molecular hydrogen to the power of minus one. And so this will be C, uh, CH2 to the power of one, in this case. This is equal to AT, which again is a, is a is exponential of uh, the sum over J of mu J times the chemical constants. But this time I have a, a pressure dependence because now the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients is, uh, uh, is one. And I had the mass action law p to the minus the sum of the, of the stoichiometric coefficients, and therefore I have a pressure at the denominator. Okay, so the situation can be uh, now uh, used as in a similar in a similar case as in the previous case. Suppose that I fix the pressure and uh, uh, I fix the temperature again. This equation of p can tell me in which direction my reaction can go. But what, what is interesting with respect to the previous case is that now I can work at a fixed temperature and change the pressure, for instance. And you see that at fixed temperature, if I decrease the pressure, now of course what happens is that I will have a lot of atomic hydrogen and less molecular hydrogen. Whereas if I increase the pressure, uh, this term is small and they have a lot of H2. So an increasing pressure, more and more formation of H2. Of course, this is a fixed temperature. Okay, so which is somehow very, uh, very intuitive in the sense that if I have a situation in which the pressure is large, then it's very easy somehow to form molecular hydrogen. Uh, whereas the opposite occurs when the pressure is small. If the pressure is small, this molecular hydrogen will, uh, may, 
will, uh, let's say, um, will break and will form atomic hydrogen. Okay? So, in this situation, not only the temperature to play the role, but also the pressure can keep the, the temperature fixed and increase the, uh, or decrease the pressure. And again, we know in which direction my reaction will, uh, will, uh, will go in order to reach the chemical equilibrium. Okay? And of course, I can do also the opposite in the sense I can fix the temperature and I can fix the pressure and change the temperature. And then again, I can, uh, I can compute uh, qualitatively which is the direction in which my reaction will, will, uh, will go in order to reach uh, uh, the, the chemical equilibrium. Okay? So I find it very useful in general. And uh, one thing that one can do uh, by using this formalism. Um, And now I will just introduce this topic that I will not finish today. Is to study a process. <clears throat> which is the thermal ionization of atoms. So what we will do is to uh, basically try to answer the following question. We are in this room and we know the temperature of this room and uh, uh, we uh, focus our uh, <coughs> on a specific uh, atom and we ask ourselves uh, how many uh, atoms are ionized once uh, uh, I fix the temperature. Now, what is interesting uh, about this calculation, about this application of, uh, of the formula that we have just uh, introduced, uh, is that, uh, uh, well, naively, one will say, okay, I know quantum mechanics, uh, and I know that uh, somehow the, the number of ions must be suppressed uh, with an exponential, which is the exponential of uh, minus the ionization energy divided by the temperature. So, in the sense that uh, somehow I need to provide uh, a certain energy for, to, for, the, for the electrons in order to, uh, to, to drip no? from, uh, uh, from the atom. And uh, this energy must be more or less of the same magnitude of the ionization energy. So, I do expect uh, on a qualitative level to have uh, an exponential suppression of the ions. Okay? where the exponential suppression is provided by the ionization energy as compared to the thermal energy. So, we imagine that there is something like uh, KBI divided by KBT, where I is the ionization energy. For instance, if I consider uh, electrons uh, uh, the ground state of hydrogen, this ionization energy will be like 13 electron volts, okay, which is huge uh, for what in, as compared to the temperature, in the sense that the temperature here at, three, at 300 Kelvin is of the order of 20, well, actually, it's 26 milli electron volts, and therefore it's much less than the ionization energy. In any case, what we will find is actually that the number of atoms which are ionized actually uh, not so uh, not so suppressed. So it, it has an exponential suppression. This is correct, but we can compute actually that there is an, an additional factor here that depends on the pressure that provides uh, a significant uh, amount of ionization even at uh, at. Um, at the low temperature, or let's say even at a temperature which is uh, much less than the ionization, uh, than the ionization energy. Okay, 
So we will try to do this calculation. Let me just introduce the reaction that we are going to uh, follow. So basically, I have a atom A um, and there will be, this atom will be uh, present in two forms in a form of ionized or could be neutron. <clears throat> and I'm talking about just one process of ionization, okay? And of course then I have electrons. And the reactions I'm uh, uh, talking about are the reaction of ionization or the combination, if you want, which is uh, uh, the following. I have an ion of A plus electron minus A0 is equal to zero. Okay? So, for instance, uh, a situation like this, uh, uh, where, where is it present? Well, when you talk about plasma, okay? So when you have a plasma of particles, uh, typically this plasma has a high temperature, and of course, uh, you have a certain number of ions, uh, or, or let's say charged, charged particles, which are free to move, and uh, these kind of reactions uh, will regulate uh, the number of, of, of uh, charged with free particles, basically, okay? Uh, now, the stoichiometric coefficients here are 1, 1, and um, minus 1. And therefore, I can immediately write uh, the mass action law in this form. Suppose that I call of C plus C plus will be the concentration of um, A plus, so of ions, of ions, sorry. This one is the C minus the concentration of electrons. And C0 will be the concentration of A0. A0, okay? Which are the three types of particles that are uh, uh, present in this reaction. So the law of mass action is telling me that C plus times C minus divided by C0 is equal to this function a of t that we will compute next time divided by the pressure because again uh, I have one plus one is uh, uh, two so it is uh, two minus one is one and then I have uh, p to the minus sum over u j so then I have one minus one or p to the minus one over. okay so the starting point next time will be this one. So what we need to compute is this uh, A of T, and from this calculation we will obtain the so-called Saga equation that provides uh, a way to compute the degree of ionization of a gas once it is in temperature. Um, no, okay, I stop, I stop here because now it's, it's too late. Va bene, allora noi ci vediamo, dunque questo giovedì c'è vacanza di nuovo, vero? Sì. Ecco, io Mi sa di sì. diciamo che io potrei pure fare lezione, però adesso io non, <ride> non so quanto, quanto, quanto voi siate, diciamo, legati alla festa di San Giorgio, vero? Credo di San, San Giorgio, immagino. Comunque, vabbè, c'è festa, quindi non facciamo lezioni, cioè per farla breve, ok? Quindi, quindi ci, vediamo, uh, ci vediamo martedì prossimo. Va bene. Okay. Eh, magari nel frattempo provate a decidere questa cosa della mezz'oretta in più. Cioè io...
Mm -hmm. cioè, purtroppo negli altri giorni ho un po' di difficoltà a fare lezione perché sono so già l'altro corso. E fare mezz'ora in più invece il giovedì eh, credo che sia... Allora, giovedì di, di sicuro noi, noi facciamo dalle 9 alle 11, quindi di sicuro non possiamo far, fare fino alle 11 e mezza perché c'è l'altro corso. Se volete fare che cominciamo alle 8 e mezza è anche una possibilità, però boh, insomma, decidete voi, va bene? E poi vi fate sapere. Noi, noi intanto ci vediamo martedì con l'orario... No, martedì. Sì, martedì. Eh, e nel frattempo magari decidete poi mi scrivete una mail. Ok? Grazie. Va bene. Ok. Arrivederci. 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 Arrivederci.